Welcome, folks, to this um, evening session at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Thank you so much all for coming. What a wonderful full house. Um, my name is Jenny Niven. I'm Head of Literature at Creative Scotland, um, and I am delighted to be joined by Laura Bates this evening. Before we get started, because I'd just make sure that your phones are on silent, please do tweet with the um, Ed Book Fest hashtag, um, but make sure you're not going to make any noise out there with your devices. Um, yeah, could we start, please, by giving Laura Bates the warmest welcome? <laughs> Not much encouragement needed there. You're in a, <laughs> in a safe space. It's nice. Laura Bates is a journalist, writer and founder, as you all probably know, of the Everyday Sexism Project. She's the author of Everyday Sexism, this beautiful book, and Girl Up, more of which uh, later. She is a fearless campaigner and champion of women's rights, and she was actually recently awarded the British Empire Medal for Services to Gender Equality. That was just last year in 2015. Good job. People are not. <laughs> <laughs> There is so much to talk about um, that we are going to dive straight in. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the Everyday Sexism Project, um, a few of the kind of key issues in there. Um, and then I'm going to, after about halfway through, probably open the floor to you guys, because it feels like the sort of event that people are going to have a lot of things that, that you want to say and that you want to ask. Um, and I'm not going to hog Laura for the whole time. Um, but just to set us up and start us off, would you like to read a little bit, Laura? From, yeah. Um, from girl okay. up. I'll just read a tiny bit from the very first page to give you a flavour of the book. You've been getting messages since you were a baby. Messages about who you are and what you're good at, about how the world sees you and what you should do if you want to succeed. They're the kind of messages you don't really think about because they're all around you all the time. They said you need to be thin and beautiful. They told you to wear longer skirts, avoid going out late at night and move in groups never accept drinks from a stranger, and wear shoes you can run in more easily than heels. They instructed you to wear just enough makeup to look presentable, but not enough to be a slag, to dress to flatter your apple, pear, hourglass figure, but not to be too slutty. They warned you if you're strong, opinionated, or take control, you'll be shrill, bossy, a ball breaker. They asked you why you can't take a joke. They informed you that you should know your place. They told you that's not for girls, take it as a compliment, don't rock the boat, that'll go straight to your hips, smile darling. They told you that beauty is on the inside, but you knew they didn't really mean it. Well fuck that, I'm here to tell you something else. Thank you. <laughs> so Laura, just to um, start us off, you talked about, I think it's in Everyday Sexism rather than in Girl Up, but about there being a tipping point for yes. you that kind of brought you into working in this field. Can you just tell us what your tipping point was? Yeah, it was a really, really terrible week in 2012. And it was quite interesting to realise what it took because looking back now beyond that point, there were just so many things as I think everybody knows. But for me, it was the fact that these things just happened in the space of a few days, really, really short space of time. Um, one of them was being followed home by a man really quite aggressively sexually propositioning me, refusing to take no for an answer. So I had to walk past my house so he wouldn't know where I lived, one of those situations. Um, another was being groped on the bus by a stranger sitting next to me. And I was on the phone to my mum. It was relatively late at night. And because I was in that bubble of being on the phone, I said something out loud in a way I don't think I otherwise would have felt confident to do. So I stood up and I moved away from him. He sort of slid his hand up my legs and grabbed my crotch. And I said to my mum, I'm on the bus. This man just groped me. And everybody on the bus heard. And everybody looked away. Every single person, they looked down at their phones and they looked out the window. God. And it sent such a clear message to both of us, to me, don't bring this into the public domain. This is your thing. You deal with it, mm. making me feel ashamed and embarrassed like I'd done something wrong. And to the guy groping someone on the bus, this is fine. No one will say a word. This is socially acceptable. Don't you worry. Go off and do it again. And then there was a, a, a few days later, I was walking down the street and I was walking past some guys who were unloading some scaffolding off the back of a truck. And within a meter, as I walked past so close to them, as if I wasn't even there, one of them just looked at the other and went, look at the tits on that. 
not even heard of that. And at the end of this week, I was just sitting down thinking about these things and what an awful week it had been. What suddenly struck me was that if any one of those things had happened on its own, I wouldn't have been sitting there thinking about it because it was normal, because I was used to it, because so many similar things had happened. And it was really that moment that mm. made me think, why is it normal? But what really was the shocking thing for me, I think, was that I then started talking to other women and girls and saying, have you ever experienced anything like this? And I honestly thought, that stage so normalized and inured we are to it that a few people might say oh yeah I've got this story of this one thing that happened you know <coughs> one or two and of course mm. it was every woman I spoke to and it was on my way to meet you just now this happened yesterday this happened every day at work this happens and I started to see this kind of mosaic this map of these little things mm. rolled out so many women said to me until you've asked me I've never told anyone any of these stories as they were taking them off on their fingers because it's normal, isn't it? You just put up with it. You can't make a fuss, can you? You know, you wouldn't have a long career at the company or you wouldn't want to risk saying something back. All these silencing factors. And I started trying to talk about it and I started calling it sexism. And I just got shut down by people saying, no, sexism doesn't exist anymore. Women are equal now. There's no problem. Everything's fine. And I didn't know anything about it. It was 2012. I didn't know anything about any of these things. And I thought maybe they were right and I was overreacting. So I just looked into it because it seemed to me that idea women are equal now was the reason I was being given for why you're making a fuss about nothing, you're overreacting, mm. he meant it as a compliment, you need to get a sense of humour. So I looked into that reason why I wasn't allowed to make a fuss and just everywhere, I started in politics because I thought, you know, controlling the decisions that we make and I found how few women in politics here in Scotland as well, but then in the UK and even now after our most recent elections in, in London, Fewer than a third of our MPs is female. There's more men in Westminster now than there has ever been female politicians. Um, fewer than a fifth of the membership of the House of Lords. And everywhere where people are making decisions, really, that affect the rest of our lives on a daily basis. So only seven out of 38 Lord Justices of Appeal are female. Only 18 out of 108 High Court judges. But I knew that if I went back to those people who told me, don't make a fuss, they would say, with those stats, they'd say, OK, fine, maybe men are more likely to go into those fields. Mm. You know, women will be outnumbering men in other areas. So I looked into the arts where I thought those people might most stereotypically expect to see loads of women and found that at the National Gallery in London, uh, out of a collection of uh, 1,200 paintings, it has paintings by 10 women, uh, that it had been over 14 years since a woman had been hired to create a piece for the main stage at the Royal Ap Opera House, that there are 573 listed statues around the country commemorating people of inspiration, but 15% of them are of women and only one of them is of a black woman. And it literally was just everywhere I looked, everywhere, that only fewer than one in 10 of our engineers is female, the Royal Society has never had a female president, only 6% of its fellowship are women, there are 50% of chemistry undergraduates, but only 6% of professors, they only write one-fifth of front-page newspaper articles, 84% of these articles are about a male subject or expert. You know, they only have 28% of speaking roles in the major films every year, but they're three times more likely than men to take their clothes off. And I just kept finding these things. And then I found that over two women a week are killed by a current or former partner, that 85,000 women are raped in England and Wales every year. And I thought, no, actually, it doesn't add up to say women are equal now, don't make a fuss. And that's where it all started. Yeah. <laughs> So how did that then lead on to the Everyday Sexism project itself? Well, I figured I couldn't try and solve a problem if people wouldn't even accept that it existed. There was yeah. a missing step there. And I thought, actually, before we can even begin tackling it, maybe there's just a, an awareness thing that's missing. Um, so I thought what really... Because I hadn't realised either until I'd heard all these amazing women's stories, so I thought maybe I could do that for other people. Mm. If there could be some way that we could all put our stories in one place, then you can't say you're making it up, you're overreacting, because here are 50 people who've experienced the same thing. Mm. And it was really that, at the beginning, it was that simple. I thought maybe if 50 people's stories ended up in the same place, then the next time we have these arguments, we can say, look, this is a problem, it is happening, it's not, you can't just say it doesn't happen. And I really just, that was what I, I thought, I thought it would be 50 stories. <laughs> um, and I thought that, was, that, that would be it on my Facebook wall. <laughs> and the numbers now are, what, It's now 000? around 120,000. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. But when you list all of those injustices and all those terrible statistics, I mean, I, I found myself in rooms um, recently in a few different situations with groups of feminists, mm. other women who are talking about these issues. And almost every time I find somebody of um, either my generation or older who are, feel aggrieved and upset and don't understand why things haven't got better. Because um, myself, I mean, I studied feminism at university some time ago. Um, and even at that point, it felt like because we've explored and raised these issues, we've come a long way. We all understand what the problem is. Um, you know, there, ha there have been some changes in society and things are different mm -hmm. that would suggest that it's heading in one particular direction. But 20 years later, it doesn't really <laughs> look <laughs> that way. Yeah. Um, what, what is happening? Why do you think that that is the case? Well, I think part of the problem is when we say we all understand what the problem is, mm. we all understand what the problem is. But I think there is still this massive amount of misconceptions about feminism, misconceptions about the problem, people who don't realise how bad it is. I think that women feminists, women, women's rights activists, the women's mm. sector have been doing incredible work for many decades, not just for the last 20 years, but course, also yeah. for the last 20 years. <coughs> and one of the things I find really tough is that people often say this and then they say, so, you know, feminism's failed, hasn't it? You right. know, it, it's, and I think actually feminism has made incredible gains and it's just a massive battle that we're still fighting. And of course, there's still such a long way to go. Mm. Um, I think that the problem is huge and, and that's why it's taking us a long time. Mm. Um, but I don't think it's a kind of failing or something about other generations. I think that's such a great way of blaming, victim blaming, Ourselves. essentially yeah, blaming absolutely. women for the problem. Yeah. yeah, a lot of what you talk about in Everyday Sexism and in Girl Up is about institutionalised sexism and yeah. modes of behaviour that people don't even instantly kind of recognise as, as having sexism at its root. Um, can you just talk about that a little bit more and perhaps about how you can challenge that? Because that mm. insidious kind is almost the most difficult. It is, yeah. The, the really normalised stuff, the stuff that we all kind of take in from the world around us that means that we grow up doing it automatically because we've learned from such a young age this is what normal looks like. Mm. It's really hard to challenge, partly because it's so ingrained that you have to literally unlearn it, all of us. But also, I think, because people get very defensive when you challenge something like that that they're doing automatically, particularly if it isn't something deliberate or malicious. It's, it's not mm. about women hating. It's just something they've never questioned, especially perhaps if they're a man who might never have experienced or witnessed something like this. There's this m critical mass, I think, of men who have no idea this is happening, who wouldn't dream of doing it themselves, mm. but haven't necessarily recognised it's going on. And that's hard to challenge because there's an immediate knee jerk reaction of you must be trying to blame me for something right but also institutionally this is written into the the buildings and the structures around us from our politics to our media you know things like I think a great example of this is a headline on the BBC News website last week where there was a, a horrible attack in Russell Square in London and a woman was killed and the BBC front page had this headline that said woman killed in Russell Square attack named and the subheading underneath was a uh, victim of Russell Square attack named as eminent professor's wife. N the story was mm -hmm. her name. The whole point of the story was that she'd been named and yet she was positioned by the media as, as somebody's wife, as, as an appendage. And I think that's a great example of the mm. kind of really subtle ways that it can kind of frame the world and the way that we see the world. Yeah. I mean, the, the Olympics is a fabulous case in point Classic about that. Example. We've been watching yeah. that all week and, you know, it's, it's almost called out as often as it is, you know, a problem. But it's extraordinary to me that you could still <laughs> report in the way that lots of you know, people who should know better are doing. Yes. Have there been uh, instances of that that you've picked up on? Yes, the so several. There was the uh, headline about a woman who won a medal and the headline was wife of a Chicago Bears linesman wins yeah. medal. Um, there was another one, a woman who won, I think, a gold medal and the camera panned over to her husband in the crowd and the commentator said, and there's the man responsible. <laughs> I mean, really, just like extraordinary. There was a gymnast, I think, who was criticised because her her leotard was said not to compliment her skin tone. I mean, particularly in sport as well, we are Good seeing women Lord. experiencing racism and sexism yeah. combining as well, massively. Yeah. Serena Williams is a great example of that, you know, just a horrendous kind of intersection of different prejudices informing each other as well. Mm. 
There was one in the back of the Sunday Herald today that is a team of four, I, I, I can't remember actually which sport it was, but four gold medal winning mm. women. And it says, girls night out in the oh back. Or, Do you know? <laughs> like Just, yeah, the discomfort with the word woman is something I've really mm. noticed in the commentating actually, that they either want to call them girls or they want to say ladies which is just so weird when these women are doing these incredible feats of athleticism, legging, and, you know, that's a very talented lady. <laughs> yeah. just, you can't imagine them as, like, the men are streaking around the pitch, going, and look at those gentlemen go. <laughs> it's just wooden. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> there was a good uh, Radio 4 discussion about that. People probably heard it last Sunday about, um, about when you use women and when you use mm. ladies in sport, and it was about how you never, ever hear of... You always hear of um, women's football teams. My own football team is the same, Edinburgh. South Ladies FC, awesome. but you never hear of it be ladies when it's women's rugby. It's always women's no. rugby. It's not ladies rugby because that's the wrong type of lead. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's a strange. Sort Doing of a whole other stigma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm conscious that there's lots of people out there who want to ask many many things. Um, one of the things, though, that worries me as a parent um, is that the... And again, harken back to maybe 10 or 20 years ago, maybe probably much, much longer, but this m idealised version of femininity and, mm. um, and actually of masculinity too, um, and what that is doing to our young people and how much capitalism <laughs> is contributing to that, but yeah. what we as responsible consumers, what should we be doing about that? And are there ways that we can challenge that? I think there are, definitely. I think it's really, really difficult. And I think the only way to challenge it is to take it on on as many different levels as we possibly can all the time. So I think that it means challenging this kind of sexist culture when we see it, when people are challenging uh, American outfitters because they're selling a skirt with a picture of a girl who looks 13 bending over and showing her crotch, whether it's challenging retailers who are selling padded bras that say Little Miss Naughty to 10-year-old girls, whether it's educating our kids. I mean, I think for me, one of the biggest catch-alls, one of the biggest ways that we could tackle so much of this mm. would be to have really, really good sex and relationships education right. in all schools that deals with things like gender stereotypes and online porn and healthy relationships and consent and gives young people basic information about their rights and their bodies, young people of all genders, because it is so scary and confusing. Mm. Uh, we know from the all-party parliamentary group report that was released recently that girls are five years old when they first start to worry about the size and shape of their bodies. You're not old enough at that age to be making a kind of informed judgment about these influences. It's mm. just, this is what I am as a woman. This is how I'm judged. And mm. we know that a quarter of seven-year-old girls is dieted to lose weight, and that by the time they reach 10, that number goes up to 80%. So the impact of that is just huge, that message, you are your looks, you are your body, and mm. specifically whether your body is extremely thin, large-breasted, white, uh, long-legged, and men want to sleep with you, mm. essentially. It's so young. Yeah. And we could do so much, I think, to offset it. There are just so many of these influences. We know that young people are massively influenced by online porn, which often yeah. shows women being hurt and humiliated and I see this firsthand you go into a school and you talk to a girl of 13 and she says I'm so scared to have sex I cry nearly every night because a boy showed me a video on his mobile phone and I didn't realize that when you have sex the girl has to be hurting and crying and if there's no one anywhere else in their life saying oh hey by the way this is what sex might be like and this is what consent means then you think that's real and that's scary for for anyone mm. i was in a school the, one of the most tragic things ever recently where they'd had a rape case involving a 14 year old boy and a teacher had said to him why didn't you stop when she was crying and he had looked straight back at the teacher and said because it's normal for girls to cry during sex and these are the kind of things I'm hearing in schools really regularly. Rape is a compliment, really. It's not rape if she enjoys it. You can't be raped by your boyfriend because you have to have sex with your boyfriend. A rapist is a stranger in an alleyway. Mm. You know, we, we obviously assume that we have to teach kids how to make change in a shop so that they can go out and have that universal experience of shopping for food. We teach them how to read maps so that they can physically get around in their life. Here's another universal experience, mm. and we give them nothing to help navigate it. It makes right. no sense. So that leads us 
us very neatly on to grow up, yes. doesn't it? What was the project behind that, behind that? Well, it was kind of that, really, this <coughs> endless frustration of going into schools, recognising how much confusion there was, also going into universities, just basically talking to young women about the bombardment that they were experiencing. Mm. Everything from online porn to this kind of retro, slut-shaming, sexism, sort of prude whore dichotomy that is being pressured and pushed onto them, mm. to online harassment and abuse on social media. And it didn't feel like there was very much, partly because of this zero compulsory sex and relationships education. No one was saying to them, actually, it's all right. You know, actually, you do have the right to say this or that right. or to make this decision. And actually, it's not just uh, that you're a prude or a whore and there's nothing in between. Um, but also, really, that adults, when they knew about it at all, had this idea often that it was like, when you talked about online porn, that you were talking about like a centerfold, a Playboy centerfold, but online. And the, the scale of it, or, or we're giving advice like, um, oh, well, if you don't like it, then just turn off Facebook if someone sent you a message. And that wasn't helpful for that generation no. and for their world, the reality of their world. So we campaigned for years, desperately tried to get this stuff on the curriculum. And in the end, I kind of banging my head against a brick wall. I wanted to write a book that would hopefully be useful for young women in their 20s in their teens, but also for everyone else to kind of have a window into that world, and that's what Girl Up was, really. Mm. Is the research at the minute uh, really up-to-date research on what is happening in terms of young people's exposure to porn and things online, and what yes. is that revealing? There is. So the most recent research that we have, which is an ICM poll for the BBC, found that 60% of young people are 14 or younger when they first see it, and that a quarter are 12 or younger. So that's 25% or 12, so 25 or, younger. Or, 12 or younger, that the majority of those come across it when they're looking for something else or have it sent to them accidentally. So there is a real sense of kind of confusion and shock there. But also that 60% of 14 year olds have seen it. And that's so crucial because when we talk about sex education, you always get MPs, usually conservative MPs saying, oh, no, 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 we can't expose them to that kind of thing. You know, I don't want you talking to kids about sex. You know, or um, someone in Parliament stood up recently when they debated it and said it will send up the rates of teen pregnancy. And I think that's where we need to say 14-year-olds, 60% of 14-year-olds are seeing this incredibly mm. extreme, incredibly explicit, often misogynistic stuff. If you choose to bury your head in the sand, then mm. all that there is to compete with that is a vacuum. Whereas we have the option to give them some age-appropriate, healthy information to offset that, to give them another option. And that's right. I mean, it's the type of porn that they're seeing, isn't it? Yeah. It's not just so much the volume, although that's obviously an enormous problem, but it's the misogyny and the violence. I think so. I think the porn that we have at the moment reflects our society. And one of the things I did for this book is I, I tried to navigate uh, porn as if I was a 12 or 13 year old who didn't really know even what it meant. Mm. So I literally just typed in the word porn into Google and I clicked retu hit return and I clicked the top link. So I tried to go for the most mainstream, easily accessible, if you were just sort of curious. And what really struck me about it was, if I was a young person, I was exploring it like that, and I wasn't actually going to click on a video. I was just sort of looking, but I wasn't going to click anything. The page that you get that comes up, the first page, it's got small thumbnail videos with descriptions, and every description is of a type of woman. Often they were very racist stereotypes, but also they were stereotypes around very, very, very young teenage girls mm. or um, mill you can imagine, and then much nastier words, and then having something really brutal or violent done to them. So it was like, you know, teen gets her asshole smashed. It was those were the f sorry, I know those were the kinds of phrasings. Mm. And then on the right hand side, there was a GIF, a kind of running video advert before. So again, I hadn't clicked anything, and it showed three women in quick rotation, all being taken from behind. You could just see their faces. You couldn't see the face of the man. All of it was from a male perspective, as if you were the male gaze. And and they were screaming out in pain, and the caption was, punish tube. So if you're a 12-year-old, all you do is type in the word porn and click once, and you get the message, sex is something really violent that happens to women, mm. and it, it hurts, and, and it's about punishing them. So th that's like the scratching the surface of the most ready available stuff on the internet. Right. So what is the project for Girl Up? How do you intend to use that as a tool to kind of help kids navigate this, and young women as well, it's not just young yeah. children. Yeah, for everyone really well. 
It's got a lot in it that I try to make really practical and kind of um, concrete because I really wanted to address the fact that there weren't these concrete solutions mm. being given that were useful in girls' everyday lives. So it has things in it like comebacks to the kinds of things that girls are telling us that they hear a lot of in school. Um, it has things in it like instead of saying to a girl who's received an unsolicited dick pic or is being put under pressure to send a photo of herself to a boy, just turn it off or just don't reply, we've got these kind of easily snappable pictures that you can send back on your smartphone that say, you know, with balloons, congratulations, you have a penis. Um, <laughs> or, oh, poor, you poor thing, do you need to see a doctor about that? Or, you know, that kind of thing. And if someone asks to see a picture of your tits, we've got a cartoon of two blue tits giving the middle feather. So it's that kind <laughs> of, you know, things that are, it's, it's not doom and gloom. Yeah. And it's also packed full of some really brilliant comebacks and stories that we've heard from young women themselves about ways that they found it constructive to deal with this stuff. Mm. We heard from a a woman recently who was walking down the street and there was a man on a roof doing some work and he was really shouting at her about her breasts. So she tried to ignore him and then in the end she shouted back and said, why would you do this? You know, you're making me really uncomfortable. How would you feel if someone was shouting about your body as you walked down the street? And he laughed in her face and started shouting worse abuse. So she said, okay, gave you a chance and she took his ladder down and walked away. <laughs> 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 Left him up there. <laughs> so... I think that's really important to say that the Girl Up is <laughs> its not kind of doom and gloom. It's, yeah. it's hopefully uplifting. It, it doesn't focus on you should be fixing the problem. It focuses on this is absolute nonsense and you know it's unbelievable that this happens and you deal with that however you want. Mm. But it also has really clear strategies. It has a 10-point plan for starting a feminist sock. It has a 10-point yeah. plan for starting a protest. It has specific stuff around things like school dress codes, which girls are telling us a lot that they're coming up against as a real problem. It has stuff for girls at university, it's hopefully quite varied and it's, mm. yeah. So one of the things that comes through, we'll go to questions in a second, but just, um, you know, a lot of the project is about sharing experience and feeling that your experience is validated mm. and things, but one of the things that is beginning to, um, I think it's a hugely positive way forward, of course it is, but it problematised feminism in a way um, that there are um, all kinds of other um, hierarchies of oppression, if you like, mm. that we all now should be aware of and yeah. that play into the discussion as well. Um, and that's a kind of characteristic of current day feminism, yes. I think, that was not around um, um, until quite recently. Um, do you want to just say a bit about that and how we navigate that and why it's important that that exists? <laughs> but that, yeah. Yeah. Well. I think it's one of the most exciting things about this sort of wave of feminism, whatever you want to call it, or, or wherever we are, that there is this kind of diversification of, of voices, mm. not enough by any means, but that very much, and particularly with, with young women when I go into schools and universities, that intersectionality is kind of the number one priority that new feminist societies are talking about and right. being aware about. And I think that it's just, it, it's, it's high time and it is so hugely important. You see this really, really clearly and it came out really early in the Everyday Sexism Project entries because from really early on we were receiving stories from women who were experiencing sexism and they were also experiencing other forms of prejudice. Mm. And what those everyday sexism entries make really clear, I think, is that these aren't separate problems that we can neatly compartmentalise. In the same way that I don't believe you can separate out street harassment and domestic violence and not see them as part of a spectrum, there was that similar thing, and, and you could see that in women's lived experiences that they were telling in their own words, because you'd hear from a disabled woman who'd been told to do a pole dance around her walking stick, or an Asian woman who was on campus with her university boyfriend when people shouted at him asking if she was a male or a bride, or a black woman who was in a job interview when the interviewer started talking about his fantasies of sleeping with spicy and exotic black women, or a trans woman who was being hounded from a public bathroom, or a woman who was out in the street with her female partner and found that men would chase them down the street asking to watch or join in. And very clearly older women who again and again use the same word across thousands of project entries, the word invisible. Older women who wrote things like, as a woman of my age, while I see my male peers often being kind of consulted for their expertise, you wonder perhaps why so many older women wear bright coats. It's because we're afraid that people will walk into us. These amazing stories. And they just, they make 
make it so clear that it, it doesn't work because someone doesn't one day walk down the street and experience sexism and on a different day homophobia, mm. that it doesn't work to look at those problems separately. And I think practically what that means is that if we're looking at a way to deal with the fact that one in four women experiences domestic violence, mm. it can only work if the plan in, is had built into it from the beginning something to tackle the fact that one in two disabled women experience it. Or that right. if we're looking at the gender pay gap, we build into the plan from the beginning, not as an afterthought, the fact that white women are earning so much more than women of colour and so on. So I think that's I think that's where we're moving towards. I don't think we're there yet. I think there's still a lot of failings. Mm. Um, but I, I do think it's really positive that it's being talked about so much more. Yeah, great. Um, do you want to just read a tiny little bit yes, more, Laura, sure. while people gear up to um, okay. ask you some questions? It's just got a couple of sections. Um, one is about kind of chat up lines and the other one is about the media uh, and the way that the media treats movies. So I'll start there. In a way, you can see why film and TV show makers feel the need to stick to the same stereotypes that we all know. It makes it much easier to name the films. Imagine if they started being honest about women in relationships. They'd have to start using much longer titles and they just wouldn't be as catchy. Jurassic Sausage Fest. Indiana Jones and the totally unrealistic relationship with a woman who would never have slept with him in a million years after he was so mean to her. <laughs> Ten things I hate about your unrealistic media-mandated beauty standards. Star Trek, inter-gratuitous nudity. The Hobbit, an unexpected lack of female characters. <laughs> Pretty, intelligent, self-sufficient woman. Game of, oh good, another rape scene that's not even in the original book. 500 days of how unfair it is that a girl isn't that into you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm um, getting really tired of being left at home with tears in my eyes while the men go off and do stuff. <laughs> Sadly, growing up in the 21st century also means dealing with the 21st century chat-up line. Gone are the days of a nice stroll together in the park, a casual chat at a friend's party or a dance in a club. Gone are the joys of the subtle approach, the flirtatious small talk, the nudges and smiles. We're living in the glorious new age of, hey, nice pic, fancy a fuck. Everything from text messages to WhatsApp, Tinder to Snapchat has readied our inboxes for the onslaught of oversexed, overconfident, overish, shriveling pickup lines. The aggression, the terrible spelling. If that's your thing, great. But if not, what do you do? Well, fear not. You're lucky enough to be hearing from someone who once genuinely experienced the darling pickup line, did you just fart because you blew me away? <laughs> Sexy. Genuinely. <laughs> so trust me when I say these responses will work. I'm sorry to have to inform you that the following are all real examples gathered through painful experience by long-suffering girlfriends and crowdsourced from women online. They say, nice dress, can I talk you out of it? You say, nice trousers, can I pay you to keep them on? <laughs> they say, are you a cowgirl, because I can see you riding me? You say, are you the back end of a pantomime horse, because you should quit while you're behind? <laughs> They say, are you spring, because you'll be coming soon? You say, are you winter, because you're leaving me cold? <laughs> they say, these are real chat-up lines. They say, are you a termite, because you're about to get a mouthful of wood? <laughs> right? You say, are you a wild pig, because you bore me to tears? <laughs> they say, are your legs made of butter, because I'd love to spread them? You say, are your pickup lines made of marmite, because they totally stink? And finally, they say, my dick's not going to suck itself. You say, it's obviously got great taste. <laughs> All right, folks, there should be mics, I think, at both sides, which maybe just one there. So if you wait for the mic, um, we've got some questions. Up in the middle, in the back there. Hi there. Um, on balance, do you feel that social media is a good or a bad thing for feminism? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Such a hard question. Uh, I mean, I think it's absolutely brilliant in so many ways. I think everyday sexism wouldn't have happened without it. Um, I see incredible campaigns using it every day. 
Um, I see women who will send us a tweet, a woman in Peru who's just been harassed in the street, who tweets what happened from her phone, still in the street. We retweet it and suddenly a woman in India and a woman in Germany um, and a woman in London are all sending back responses, supporting her and saying, you know, this is what I did, if it helps, or, or are you okay, you're in a safe place. And that sense of solidarity is incredible to see and I think has been so important to so many of us. And we hear from so many women on social media who say, until I came across this on social media, I thought it was normal or I thought it was just me or I'd been made to feel that it was my fault, who've then gone on to report a rape for the first time, to take someone to court for workplace discrimination. We hear from so many men who say, this was retweeted into my timeline or reblogged onto my Tumblr page by a woman I know and I'm shocked and now I'm reading all these other stories and it's opened my eyes. There are so many ways in which I see it being used really well. And I also love the way it's able to build international solidarity, that we're able to support feminists in other countries doing such important work and to raise up their voices and we're able to support one another and share our platforms. And then on the other hand, you wake up every morning and someone's telling you what knife they'll use to disembowel you with while they rape you. So it's really, really hard. And I think there's a real danger that it, because it isn't being tackled at all right now, that there are perhaps vulnerable women of all ages, but I think particularly young women who are just being driven from these spaces by the fact that they mm. try to give a political opinion and somebody threatens to rape them and they just think, not for me. And because we have this younger generation at the moment who are so often labelled politically inactive or apathetic, when actually they're disillusioned with mainstream politics, so they're cutting their teeth online, they're having these debates online, that's where they're going to learn how to debate, how to construct an argument. If we then disenfranchise them out of those spaces, that is a real loss that this whole generation of young women is losing mm. that space. And it's ironic because we hear endlessly about the freedom of speech of the men who say these things to women online, but what about the freedom of speech of those women who are being driven out of those spaces? So I think my answer would be that at the moment it's a fairly close run thing, but while I see the feminist movement going from strength to strength and I'm endlessly inspired by the new campaigns that are starting all the time, I don't believe that the abuse will be able to carry on forever because this is not a sustainable situation. And I think that eventually law enforcement will have to catch up. We will keep mm -hmm. putting the pressure on it will happen. But also social media companies have got to take accountability for protecting their users. And sadly, I think that will only start to happen when it starts to affect their bottom line. But it will because people will eventually vote with their feet. So I just don't think we can go on like this forever, and that makes me hopeful that things will change. It's not quick enough, but I think hopefully the, the balance will shift further in favour of the good stuff than the bad. Are there any moves uh, with Facebook in particular at mm. the moment to redress some of that imbalance? You know, the thing that allows there to be people posting all kinds of pictures of really pornographic explicit things and then women get blocked for showing pictures of themselves mm. breastfeeding like i mean yeah, is that being it's challenged unbelievable it's being challenged there are so many women doing incredible <coughs> things around that double standard particularly mm. women running great campaigns about breastfeeding and mastectomy and periods and that kind of thing um, we ran a campaign a couple of years ago um, around the really explicit, graphic, abusive content on Facebook, mm. so stuff about rape and domestic violence, and Facebook did change their policies as a result. Right. The problem is that it takes a very long time for that stuff to have a trickle-down impact, and really it's about retraining their moderators, which is still an ongoing process. And are they and on doing them that taking, right now? taking action. So they have definitely taken action right. on it, but clearly it's not enough, it's not working quickly enough. It's so huge and there's very little incentive for them as mm. long as we unless we're all shouting all the time right. so it's it's an uphill battle and they are so far from dealing with it but mm. hopefully it's the kind of thing that people are taking them on and challenging them and pushing them and it will eventually force them shame them into yeah. getting better yeah um, if anybody's interested though and in just when you mentioned breastfeeding and campaigns there's a fabulous video that the um, poor Holly McNeish uh, mm. released last week. Yes. I don't know if people have seen that yet, but it's just a brilliant, brilliant long form poem um, that uh, yeah, champions breastfeeding, but it's done, done in yeah. inimicable Holly McNeish style. It's fabulous, it's worth looking for. Um, do we have any more questions? Yep, there's one in the end there. Hello. Uh, do you have any sympathy with situations where boys are bullied um, uh, and by over-controlling, domineering mothers, 
and can this cause later relationship problems with women? Um, well, I definitely have sympathy with boys who are experiencing any kind of abuse or any kind of harassment in, in any relationship. And I think it is really important that we try and increase the, um, the confidence of those boys in feeling able to report what's happening. That's partly why I feel like sex and relationships education is so important, because although we know that this is a problem that enormously disproportionately impacts women, we know that it is a gendered issue. We also know that our society's gender stereotypes that say boys are tough, men don't cry, actually make it very difficult for boys to come forward and report issues of abuse or sexual abuse. So I think that it's of course, I have sympathy with boys or men in those situations, and I think it's really important that we're trying to expand the conversation at school around these issues wider than saying, this is what boys will be boys and this is what girls do. Um, in terms of whether or not a relationship with a, a mum can... Uh, impact on someone's later life relationships, I'm, I'm sure that is possible. Um, but I also think that boys are impacted by the world around them and the messages that they get sent from the media, from the way that we treat female politicians, from social media, from the websites that are particularly targeted at teenage boys, websites about being a lad, about being a student that encourage them to dehumanize their female peers, to see them as mm. simply a number out of 10, to use words like slut, slag, milf, bird, chick, tramp, gash, clunge, sloppy sex, seconds to describe them instead of human names. So I think probably there's a lot more going on there. I think there's a, there's a whole melting pot um, that also has an impact on boys' relationships with women as they grow up. And that's why I think it's so important that we have ways to humanize those relationships and to teach all young people, regardless of gender, about healthy relationships and respect. Thank you. Are we up on the left here, please? Just wait for Hi there. Um, I'm a teacher and I really enjoyed um, reading your recent book and I feel like I really wanted to take absolutely everything that you wrote and put it on a PowerPoint <laughs> and take it out. Appreciate and really, I, I know that you've gone and you've spoken in a lot of schools as well and I really just wanted to know, do you have any hints or tips for other teachers and how to really bring this up? Because you'll know yourself as well that I teach secondary and it's very difficult to bring this up to kids in that way because they'll, they'll look at you and think, what do you know? Yeah. And it's really difficult, but so I'm just wondering if you have any hints from your experience of how to bring it up. Uh, yeah, definitely. First of all, I think the fact that they have a teacher like you who's aware of these issues is probably a massive leap forward compared to, you know, someone who isn't talking about this stuff. So that's in itself uh, brilliant. Um, I think for me, the best responses that I get from young people about this stuff is when I talk as little as possible and get them to talk as much as possible. And sometimes it's kind of um, awkward and they're embarrassed to talk about it in front of each other. But if you give them kind of really wide, prompt questions, you know, really, really wide. What, what do girls worry about compared to what boys worry about? And just let them go themselves. And they will bring up so many of these things themselves. You don't need to kind of sit down and do it. Or sometimes I find visual aids really, really helpful. So just something like one of the cartoons of Nicola Sturgeon, for example, during the elections, you know, the cartoons of her on a wrecking ball, the cartoons of her cleavage, mm. the, and, and just perhaps next to a picture of a male MP and the way that they're covered, um, you know, just looking at that and asking them to discuss it, letting them kind of come to these conclusions for themselves is really, really helpful in my experience. Um, yeah, I think that's really useful. There's also some great resources online, the PSHE Association and um, the SRE... Uh, sorry, sex, the, sex, the Sex Education Forum um, are really good. And there's also a really brilliant group called Sexpression, which I know has a bunch of chapters in Scotland. They train first and second year university students to go into schools and to talk to young people. And they often get a brilliant response because they see them as their peers and kind of, you know, these cool, slightly older kids. And often that's a really great way to open up these conversations as well. So one here on the left. Um, you kind of mentioned earlier about a sort of idea of a safe space and how great it is that everyone here is kind of on board with the ideology that you're representing. Um, I feel 
quite frequently that a problem with the left is that there's a lot of sort of inner talk and that we kind of help each other a lot, but then the right kind of rises up and gets even more sort of maybe bigoted or, you know, like ideology comes about that we just want to get rid of completely. I think, um, I kind of, I guess what I'm trying to ask is how do you, how do you sort of deal with that? How do you like want to get rid of that idea? How do you, how do you touch people who don't want to hear it? How do you touch people who don't yeah. want to listen at all? It's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, it's another one of those answers where it's a scattergun approach, as many different things as possible. Um, uh, we don't. The Everyday Sexism Project isn't kind of affiliated to any political party. We try and be as neutral as possible in order to reach out to as many people as we possibly can. Um, I think. Basically, what we try and do is, firstly, social media is one of the ways that we're able to reach a really, really broad spectrum of people who wouldn't necessarily seek out an event like this. Because, of the, because we've got a quarter of a million followers, it means that when one woman shares her experience, it, because it gets tweeted, retweeted by 500 other people, it means it is popping up in thousands and thousands of people's computer screens, shared by someone they know and trust and perhaps care about, and giving them something to start thinking about that they might never have even thought of, might never have occurred to them before. So that's one way through kind of social media. Another is that we take the stories that we get online and we take specific categories of them offline into the real world and put them in front of people who have the capacity to change those things specifically. So, for example, we take our entries from women in the workplace and we put them in front of ministers from all political parties when they're looking at things like equal pay or workplace discrimination and say this is what women are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis so that they're informed by those real-world stories when they're making decisions that impact women's lives. Or we took about 2,000 of our entries that were just from women on buses and tubes and we took them to the British Transport Police, who said, we know this is a massive problem, but we also know that only 5% of people ever report it. And we said, great, we've got all the reports, but we can't do anything about it. And together, from the very beginning, they looked at all of these stories, and we were able to explain that it was much broader than they realized. It wasn't just someone having stuff shouted at them on the tube, for example. It was someone masturbating in front of you on the bus, or someone following you home from the bus stop, or taking a photograph up your skirt on the escalator. And we were able able to really give them much more detail of the issue than they'd realised, but also we had women explaining why they didn't report. I had this bad experience, the police didn't take me seriously, I didn't know who to report to, I didn't think that it was a big enough deal. And they used that to retrain 2,000 of their officers and design a campaign that we then helped push out on social media that tried to get around the idea that this is normal, and it raised the reporting of sexual offences by about 40%. So ways to kind of reach organisations that can change things, but who might not be aware of the problem and the same with businesses we go into lots and lots of businesses and talk about issues that we've had from women reporting sexual harassment in the workplace putting those things out there in the workplace where people kind of have to listen and, and become aware that perhaps this happens here as well but for me the number one answer to your question how do we reach everybody how do we reach people who don't want to know is that we have to do it earlier before it's too late before it's ingrained and we have to do it in a way that guarantees we reach everybody what What's the one way to do that? Sex and relationships education. It's so rare when you work in this field, and I know there are, I've got colleagues here from incredible Scottish Women's Aid. When you work in this field in domestic or sexual violence, when you're dealing with sexism, it is so rare to be able to point to something and say this is a concrete action that would change things, that we could actually do, that would make things better. Mm -hmm. And here we have something that we know would make a difference and it's being rejected. So for me, really, that is the answer as well to this question. That's great, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lady right in the front here, just yeah, thanks. Hi, I, leading on from that question actually, I was going to ask thanks. you a little bit about parents because mm. I think it's really appropriate that that sex, and edu sex education happens in school and relationship education, but there's a whole load of people who that's not going to happen for. Mm. And I think parents' first instinct often is to protect rather than to educate mm. and Parents are often dealing with their own insecurities, their own embarrassments. And I wonder what, thinking about Girl Up, what you think should be happening right now for people who have got children 
in that age group you were talking mm. about who are exposed to porn because I think it's our responsibility to talk really openly to our kids. Mm. I did that with my kids. They're adults now. Um, I know that I was quite in the minority yeah. and that some of my friends were quite shocked at the content of conversations I had with my kids mm. as young teenagers. And I think it's quite hard to be a parent and to be frowned on by your peer group actually for being yeah. open. I, can, I can't imagine. I think absolutely it is so hard and I completely understand that impulse to want to protect your child and not to want to believe that your child is exposed to this stuff. Um, partly that's why I wrote Girl Up because I wanted it to be a tool for parents, for godparents, aunts, anyone really with a young person in their life mm. to have kind of strategies and concrete ways of looking at it and talking about it. Um, but I think really that the best thing is little and often um, opening up a space where young people People feel like they can come to you with things because you do talk about that kind of thing so it becomes quite normal so that if something were to happen or they were to see something or be sent something at school then they'd be more likely to come to you mm. it doesn't have to be I think we often think about this as I need to sit my child down and have a terrifying massive talk <laughs> and actually I think it can be little and often and it can be based on just things that happen you know well that's interesting there's a picture of a woman's breast being used to advertise a car which has nothing to do with women's breasts that's funny isn't it let's talk about that you know things that as they come up in daily life actually you can just start building up a sense of awareness of these kinds of things and I think that when parents do that it's incredible and I think it's so hard and so wonderful when parents do Unfortunately, we know that not all parents feel able to, and we also know that 750,000 children a year witness domestic violence in their own homes, and that one in 20 children is already experiencing abuse themselves. So I think that we can't rely on it just to be parents, because for those children who are most desperately in need of these messages about abuse not being normal and about support being available, we know that they aren't necessarily getting those messages at home. So I think it has to be a joint effort, it has to be everything and both. Mm. Thank you. So in the second row here. Hello. Hi. Um, how can we back um, improve sex education and relationship education? I think it's so important and vital. And I wish we all had a teacher like that woman over there. Me too. <laughs> <She's> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm really glad you asked because this coming week we're launching a massive new campaign. Um, it's called SRE Now, Sex and Relationships Education Now. Um, the website is at srenow.org. There'll be on the website ways that you can email, ways that you can tweet, ways that you can sign a petition, ways that you can support and make noise. But I know that there is also a Scotland-specific sex and relationships education campaign going on. I think it's been very active in the Scottish Parliament. I know that there are MSPs who've been backing it. I know that Sexpression Scotland has been heavily involved. So actually probably looking them up is a good way to get into that. Mm -hmm. But please support SRE now as well. That would be fantastic. That's great. There's a couple in this, uh, the chap up the back. Hi, yeah, I'm wondering, uh, what's your uh, thoughts on positive discrimination as a way to redress balance uh, sexism wise? This is something I find really fascinating because when I first started working in this area, I was quite against positive discrimination. And the reason I was against it was because I felt like it didn't tackle the underlying problem. And it, it seems like saying women need a leg up. Um, it seems like saying, oh, you know, poor women, they're not achieving on their own. We need to give them a bit of help. When actually the reason that there is such inequality across the tops of business, politics, you name it, is because of the discrimination both over and inherent that is in place. And if we don't tackle that, then if we give women a leg up, then the problems are still there in their way to deal for them to deal with when they're in those roles. So I used to be relatively against it for that reason. But I'm actually coming around to thinking that amongst a raft of other measures to tackle the problem, as a kind of emergency short-term measure, it may be one of the best solutions that we have. And what's made me more in favour of it, actually, is how ridiculous the arguments against it are. Because when you talk to people about positive mm. discrimination, they say, oh no, but that would be outrageous because then people who weren't properly qualified would be getting the jobs. 
You know, that, that wouldn't be fair. The best person for the job wouldn't be getting the job. And I always say, if you honestly think that that's the situation, then you have to think that right now the best person for the job is getting the job, right? If you think that positive discrimination would make it unfair by giving women a leg up, you must think right now. And what that means statistically is that you have to believe that there are three times more men named John qualified to lead FTSE 100 companies than all the women in the country, because that's the <laughs> statistic that we have at the moment. Three times more men named John than women leading FTSE 100 companies. You have to believe that just by sheer <laughs> coincidence, statistically, there are almost as many men who happen to go to school with our Prime Minister qualified to be in our cabinet uh, as all the women in the whole country. You know, it just, or our previous Prime Minister, I should say. You know, it just, it statistically is a ridiculous <coughs> argument. Um, and so for that reason, and also because of this fascinating stuff around implicit bias, mm. they did this amazing study recently um, out of either Harvard or Yale University, and it was published in a journal called PNAS. And they sent out applications for science positions to thousands of jobs across the country. The CVs were identical, but half mm. of them had male names and half of them had female names. And overwhelmingly, the male candidates were more likely to get the job, were offered higher starting salaries, and were more likely to be offered personal mentoring and similar studies have shown really similar effects with uh, white sounding and non-white sounding names so this is another intersectional issue but I think for me that just really brought it home to me this is a problem so deeply ingrained it is impacting us without us even realizing it at that kind of a level at that stage of the problem I think maybe you do need to take overt action and of course when we talk about positive action people tend to think you know that you're talking about these massive leaps like if there's a, let's say there's a field in which only 20% of the jobs are held by women. And actually applications in that field are quite low for women. So maybe only 30% of the applications come from women. No one is going to say we'll have positive discrimination and 50% of the roles have to be filled by women immediately. If you look at it, positive action is usually pathetic. We're aiming for 25% mm. by 2025. We're never going to take positive action that means that someone who has never done a librarian has to be drafted in for a science position just because she's a woman. So I think there's a lot of kind of myth and kind of misconception around it. But actually, the arguments against it are ridiculous. And I think maybe in the short term, we need that kind of concrete action. Yeah. I, th I, th I think it's, that's fascinating. And I found myself mm. on the same kind of journey where I used to find that I rejected that idea and more and more have come around mm. to the idea that it, it's just not happening quick enough without yeah. it. Um, and just really briefly in my own experience, just going back to work after having my son, my second kid, um, going back to work a few weeks ago, the difference that it makes to talk to a female manager who also mm. has three children about how you manage going back <laughs> into the workplace and how you might be able to change your work and life and the office and your team and everything to be able to support you to be able to do that. I'm not saying that there's no men would be able to do that and understand, but you need to have that, that you know that sort of conversation I think it's yeah. absolutely vital and yeah that I came around to the same conclusion that it's just not quick enough mm. <laughs> and less yeah. can we quite squeeze in one more before we have to wrap up just the lady in the front on the right hi there hi. have you noticed that as far as sexism is concerned it's either more or less prevalent within the class system within the UK like for example in the working classes versus the middle and the upper classes yeah, I mean, I think it is a universal problem, but I think that that's another key area where we definitely see an intersection of different forms of prejudice. So I think one of the clearest places where this came up, actually, was in a big piece of research that we did with the TUC, which came out this week on workplace sexual harassment. And what we found was that it was an overwhelming and universal problem. 52% of women had experienced workplace sexual harassment, 63% of young women. But what was really interesting was that when you looked into it, it was women on zero hours contracts, women in the lowest paid jobs, mm. women with the least job security, who were experiencing the worst sexual harassment, who were also the least likely to feel able to report it to somebody or to complain about it, and who saw the worst outcomes when they did. That 75% who did come forward and say what was happening happening said that nothing changed and another 16% said they were treated worse as a result. So I think that's a really good example of that kind of intersection of discrimination that we're seeing and it's certainly something that's prevalent and, and something that goes cuts across in so many other areas as well. We could sit here and talk for an hour about housing, about domestic violence services and about how there's massive class intersections there as well. So I think that's another area where it's a huge problem, definitely. 
There's clearly so much to say in this topic. Can I just say, Laurie, though, I, I think it's astonishing the amount of facts and information that you have just right on the surface <laughs> about this topic. <laughs> it's really impressive, and I think that it is the truest of the weapons that we can use to navigate mm -hmm. this stuff, to have good research and to have facts and to have fantastically <laughs> articulate campaigners who are speaking about this um, every single day. So thank you so much, thank Laurie. You. For the beat. <laughs> really fantastic.